5.16 left. San Santee to kick off. And this is a good one. Inside the five. It's Malcolm Brown. Oh, what a great open field hit by Eric LeGrand. Off for play action roll out Nova. Big hit. But Sanu hangs on. He got popped after the 14-yard gain. And the player who gave the hit, that's Anthony Connor. Jets defensive lineman Dennis Bird collided with a teammate and shattered a vertebra in his neck. Steelers Ravens game. There was a passing play to Heath Miller, who was the tight end for the Steelers. As he was on his way down, a defender came by and, and looked like he took his head off. What struck me about it was when you watch the replay, the replays are so much more vivid now than they used to be. And you know, you really see how how far the neck bends back. Welcome back to the final session for this lecture. We started today discussing the importance of the vertebral column in protecting the spinal cord. Not surprisingly, injuries to the vertebral column can have a devastating consequence and require careful attention and proper diagnosis. We've already encountered a number of these in relation to specific structures, but in this final session, we'll reference a few additional injuries that you should be aware of, discuss the anatomy, and consider the diagnostic signs and prognosis. We'll start with the vertebral body compression fractures. As the name implies, compression fractures result from compressive axial loads to the vertebral column. When the load exceeds the strain limit of a vertebral body, it collapses, pushing bony fragments out in a radiating pattern. If any of these fragments project posteriorly into the vertebral canal, the result can be devastating. This is what happened in the instance of Eric Legrand, defensive tackle at Rutgers. In the game against Army, Legrand made a helmet tackle on ball carrier Malcolm Brown. The axial load from the high-impact tackle transferred through his vertebral column, resulting in a compression fracture in the C3 and C4 vertebrae, resulting in spinal cord damage. He lay motionless for several minutes before being carted off the field. He tried to give the crowds a thumbs-up gesture, but he couldn't manage it, saying that it felt like a thousand pounds. As a result of the accident, Legrand became a quadriplegic and has been confined to a wheelchair with only limited motion in his shoulders. Since the time of the injury, however, he has reported regaining the ability to wiggle his fingers and regaining sensation throughout his body. Compression fractures can occur with excessive axial loads in healthy vertebrae, but are most commonly associated with physiological loads on diseased bone. In the first session, we discussed osteoporosis and the gradual collapse of vertebral bodies over time. We can also see compression fractures as the result of landing hard on your feet, the sort of thing that happens when you miss a step and have to catch yourself. In a healthy population, no big deal, but a serious problem in an elderly patient with low bone mineral density. Take the example of a 70-year-old male who presented with back pain following a coughing fit. Notice the vertical striation pattern we discussed in the first session, which indicates osteoporosis. Hopefully you also notice the deformities within the T12 and L1 vertebrae, indicating compression fracture. What's interesting in this present case is that they performed what's called a bone spec scan, which monitors metabolic activity in healing bone tissue. Notice that only one of the vertebrae is positive, in this case the L1 vertebrae. This means that the only the L1 vertebrae was damaged in the recent event. T12 was probably fractured in a previous incident. While we're on the topic of axial loads, let's take a moment to consider the unique situation we have with the atlas, or first cervical vertebrae. The atlas is unique in that it has no vertebral body. Instead, the axial load is entirely distributed through the lateral masses into C2. Notice the wedge-shaped appearance of these lateral masses. Because of this geometry, the axial load is dissipated out laterally, as well as inferiorly. In instances where the axial load exceeds the strain limit on the bone, we end up with fractures in multiple locations around the atlas, and the lateral force pushes these now separated fragments out in a radiating pattern. The result is a burst fracture, also known as a Jefferson fracture for the physician who first described it. 
Surprisingly, Jefferson fractures are not commonly associated with spinal cord injuries. This is because the bone fragments project away from the vertebral column rather than internally. Regardless, there's still a great deal of instability and the head should be immediately stabilized as excessive movements have been known to result in subsequent cord damage. Another structure damaged from compressive axial loads are the intervertebral discs. Remember that I compared the intervertebral disc to a jelly donut a while back? So what do you think happens to an intervertebral disc when compressive forces exceed the strain limits? Same thing that happens to a jelly donut. Disc herniation occurs frequently in the lumbar region and is a common source of low back pain. The condition results from protrusion of the nucleus pulposa through weakening in the annulus fibrosus. It is commonly seen with sudden axial loads in the lumbar vertebral region and becomes more frequent with advanced age due to the degenerative changes in the intervertebral disc. Another type of vertebral fracture is spondylolysis. Notice the similarity in name to spondylosis, despite it being a very different condition. Note that the suffix osis means inflammation, whereas lysis means break, or in this case, fracture. The condition results from compressive loads within the vertebral arch, typically resulting from forceful hyperextension. This results in fractures within the pars interarticularis, which makes up the posterior pillars of the vertebral column. Typically, the injury is bilateral and results in instability in the vertebral column at the site of the injury. Radiographically, spondylolysis can be easily identified in the lumbar region using the oblique radiographic view. As the pars interarticularis forms the neck of the Scotty dog we've discussed previously, a fracture in this region appears radiographically as a collar on the Scotty dog. Take a quick second to try and get this image of a dog wearing a collar in your head. Now, if I were to take the collar away again, hopefully the image remains and you can make out the spondylolysis in the present patient. If you can, then congratulations, you just correctly confirmed a diagnosis. If not, try rewatching the segment a few times till the image of the dog and collar remain in your mind's eye. The consequence of a bilateral spondylolysis is instability of the vertebral column at the level of the break. Remember that we have our three pillars supporting the vertebral column. A bilateral spondylolysis eliminates the support of the posterolateral columns, meaning that the intervertebral joint is the sole support. Also remember that the joint is comprised of a fibrocartilaginous disc, which has some elastic properties. This means that the column can shift around without the support of the posterolateral columns. This type of injury is common in the lumbar region and can result in the anterior shift of the superior portion of the column relative to the inferior portion of the column due to the differences in weight distribution across the lordotic curve. This slippage secondary to spondylolysis is spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis can be easily identified in the lateral radiographic view due to the malalignment of the vertebral bodies. It shouldn't be too hard to pick out the disruption of the anterior and posterior boundaries. Notice in this MRI image on the right the elastic deformation of the L5-S1 intervertebral disc, as well as the consequence of this type of injury, namely compression of neural elements within the vertebral canal. We'll be discussing those in a later lesson. Spondylolysis can occur at any region along the vertebral column, but is most common in the lower lumbar region, as well as within the C2 vertebrae, or axis. C2 spondylolysis is often referred to as a hangman's fracture. The term was coined because of the high frequency of this fracture type during hanging executions, when the hangman's knot is placed inferior to the chin. Remember, spondylolysis is typically seen with hyperextension. When a forward-facing noose pulls taut, it forcefully hyperextends the neck, which appears to typically affect the C2 vertebrae. In these instances, death was almost instantaneous, resulting from blunt force trauma to the brainstem and spinal cord. The condition can occur with any forceful hyperextension of the neck and is not uncommon in motor vehicle accidents. Here is a sagittal CT series of a 25-year-old female involved in a motor vehicle accident. Notice the fracture line between both pars interarticularis sections as we scan back and forth, which we can also observe in an axial section. Fortunately, the accident was not fatal and the patient underwent surgery to fixate and stabilize C2 on C3. 
Another type of fracture common in the C2 vertebrae is an odontoid fracture. Odontoid fractures can be classified as type 1, occurring to the tip, type 2, which is a complete fracture to the neck of the odontoid process, or type 3, which leads into the body of C2. Of the three types, type 2 is the most serious, as it results in distinct instability, allowing anterior translocation of the atlas on the axis, which can lead to cord damage. Hyperextension injuries of the neck don't always involve bone breaks. In fact, probably the most common form of hyperextension injury is whiplash. This is commonly seen during rear-end collisions when the head is not properly supported and is thrown backwards during sudden acceleration. Whiplash is associated with soft tissue injury to muscles that resists back extension as well as to the anterior longitudinal ligament. Compression fractures are also not uncommon. The condition is typically associated with referred pain and headache due to nerve compression and muscle spasm, particularly in the suboccipital region. That wraps up this particularly lengthy lesson on the vertebral column. Don't worry, most lessons won't be nearly as long. There's just a lot to get through through this session. In the next lesson, we will literally be putting the meat on the bones by looking at the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the back. Until then, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.